and um, I, I picked a, a short part uh, to read to you today from the first half of the book. So my book is divided into two parts, before the inauguration and after the inauguration. And when I first started writing this book, someone said to me, don't underestimate the power of a story about crafting. And, um, and I took that to heart because so much of what led me to, the, to make mittens and then to give them to Bernie um, had to do with, with crafting. And as I was thinking about the stories that sort of you know, revolved around, around that moment in my, t in my life, um, it seemed that every crafting, every really meaningful crafting project that I had done, mostly sewing quilts and, um, and mittens, had, was a response to some other trial or, um, or difficulty that I'd experienced. And so um, in one of the early reviews of my book, someone said, this book is actually a love story to crafting and to Vermont and to teaching. Um, but I would argue that it is also a love story to motherhood. And so, um, so I'm going to read uh, from the portion of the book that talks about uh, when we finally had a child um, and we, we, had, we really struggled to have a, a, a child. And, um, and when she was born, she was born with a club foot. And so we chose to treat her with the Ponsetti method, which is a, um, a stretching and, and casting um, method of, of treating club foot. So anyway, this is from the chapter on motherhood. My mother told me once that she remembered nursing me in the early mo morning of her 30th birthday. She was looking out the window and a big fat bunny hopped by. It was late April, 1978. I don't know why that particular memory of hers stuck with me. There was something so sweet and simple about that moment, a moment that I experienced but obviously could never remember. As mothers, we are the memory keepers of so many precious little moments. The spring Helen was born was stunning. The flowering trees in our neighborhood had exploded in purple, pink, and white. Their perfume wafted into the open window of Helen's nursery. Everything felt so alive and fresh and new. I would nurse her for hours on end, sitting in the reclining chair, looking out her bedroom window. Sometimes a bunny would go by just as the sun was coming up, and I would think of my mother and how history repeats itself. Helen would eat until she fell asleep at my breast, then her head would fall back a little, her mouth still agape, lips puffed and swollen from sucking. I never got tired of gazing at her perfect little face. Sometimes I would look up at the ceiling and cry tears of overwhelming happiness to the universe. I'm not even sure if I believed in the stars or a deity of some sort, but I believed in, in something beyond myself enough to whisper my deepest gratitudes. Thank you, I would say. Thank you for this moment. Thank you for this breath, this body. Thank you for this perfect little miracle asleep in my arms. Everyone's advice was don't blink. It all goes by so fast. But in those moments, it didn't go by fast. I reclined in that armchair by the window and dozed with the warm little bundle of Helen in my arms. Then she would wake up and nurse some more. I saw many sunrises from that window and every single one went by slowly and I never blinked. I cherished every moment of my baby and had no regrets. Over the next few weeks, Helen's leg and foot were casted and recasted five times. Each time, Dr. Lyle moved the foot closer to the correct position and casted it in place. Helen was such a compliant and placid baby. She never seemed to mind. The skin behind her knees grew raw from the casts, but she slept through the night and ate like a champ. Sometimes we would post pictures on Facebook and people would ask how she broke her leg so young. 
There were a lot of teachable moments as our entire friend and family community began to understand the Ponsetti method and our choice to use it. In the end, Helen did have one small surgery to correct the club foot. It was an Achilles release. I couldn't believe such a surgery even existed. They cut Helen's Achilles tendon clear through and casted her leg with her foot flexed. Then, like another miracle, her body grew a new, a new, longer Achilles tendon. Amazing. After the surgical cast came off, Helen graduated to boots and bar braces. She had to wear them for 23 hours a day. They held her feet pointed out at what looked like an impossibly uncomfortable position. She never seemed to mind, though. Humans are made to adapt. Every time I felt overwhelmed by the doctor's appointments or the constant stares of children and the not-so-discreet sidelong looks of strangers in the grocery store, I would sit down and sew. The repetitive motion of cutting the wool and stacking the neatly cut pieces in piles on our dining room table was so satisfying. When everything else was out of control, sewing mittens was within my control. I would get lost in my crafting. My anxious new mother mind was able to completely rest in the state of the creative flow. I felt like I was part of the magical, powerful machine that is generations of women crafting. Long before we had medication and psychotherapy, long before we had iPhones and Facebook, we had each other and we had creativity. It was and always had been a force for healing. It was my therapy. I would put Helen down for a nap, pull out a beautiful sweater, and cut it up. The more difficult the Ponsetti treatment became, the more beautiful the mittens I created. When November rolled around, I had more than enough inventory to go back to the Cozy Nook Craft Fair at the Essex Free Library. Lisanne and I had made so many beautiful pairs of mittens, I couldn't wait to sit at that booth and sell them to everyone. I laid them out on my table and took pictures of my display. It was my final goodbye to our creations. They looked so perfect all together, neatly lined up, waiting to be taken home and loved by someone other than us. And I think that's where I'll stop. Yeah. Okay, so thank you so much for sharing the story mm -hmm. in your book and um, being here this evening. For those of you who haven't read it, you've caught on that it's more than just about Bernie's mittens. Mm -hmm. um, she starts on uh, Inauguration Day in 2020, but then she cycles back to um, her childhood and then she comes back around and goes into last year, mm -hmm. which is probably when you turn the manuscript. Yes. <laughs> so. Um, can you say a little bit about what made you, according to the book, a fairly private person, decide to tell your story to the world? Um, I think, well, I think that it was the fact that so many people kept asking me to tell the story. Um, and when I didn't tell the story, people made stuff up, because <laughs> that's the way the internet goes. And um, I think I, I realized that I had quite a lot to say about, about crafting and about creativity and, and about teaching and about Vermont. Um, and so this is my memoir, but it isn't the whole story. It's the, it's the part that I wanted to tell. Okay. And um, your writing process, are you a journal keeper? Mm -hmm. So you had something to go back to to recreate some of these? time mm -hmm. periods that you talk about? Yes, yeah, so I was a journal keeper from the time I was pretty young, probably 10 or 11, until I was through college. Um, and I reread those journals during the pandemic. I, I actually went into the eaves and dug them out and read them all, um, which was really funny because there were lots of professions of love for like my high, my high school crushes and <laughs> lots of drama. Um, but uh, this book, actually, I wrote it pretty soon after the inauguration because I was having trouble sleeping. And um, 
and that writing helped me to fall asleep. So especially in the second half of the book where I talk about um, you know, the media and, uh, and forging relationships with businesses, um, the conversations that I had are actually quite similar to what was said, you know, um, because I wrote them pretty much that night. <laughs> You know, I would sit down and be like, I can't believe that 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 person said that to me. And then I would write it down. Um, but and this is I, I like to think of this as creative nonfiction, because I also recount conversations from my childhood that obviously I, I, they're my memories of those conversations. And so when I have these speaking engagements, sometimes there are people in the audience who are in the book. And I, I like to just say, like, I hope where my memory meets your memory, like we find some truth because we all remember things so differently. And um, uh, now I've lost track of the original question. <laughs> oh, did I keep a journal? Yeah. Um, so in a way, this was my journal. But fairly soon after the inauguration, um, I was connected to a, um, an agent, a book agent, who tried to sell the book to lots of different you know, publishers, big publishers. And so because, he was, because I knew that he was going to try to sell the book, I wanted to write a book that was commercially popular. Um, and it didn't sell. I mean, the agents or the publishers said mostly the same thing, that it was a nice story, but they didn't think anyone would care <laughs> when it came out. And, um, and so after a year, so, well, that was very devastating, you know, because I wanted, I wanted to write the book. And, um, and after about a year, my, my contract with the, with the agent was up and I took the book back and I, you know, I rearranged the chapters and I rewrote some things and took some things out. And in the end, I wrote a, the story that I wanted to tell, um, which was a much more gritty and authentic version of, of what I had to say. And, um, and in doing that, I may have sacrificed what might have been more universally appealing about the book. But, um, but it's your story. But it is my story, yeah. And, and I, I'm proud of the book in a, in a, in a very sincere way. And, um, and I contacted Green Writers Press, which is an independent Vermont press in Brattleboro, and um, asked if they were interested. And Dee Dee Cummings, the head of that press, said, yeah, send it to me by May 31st. And by, I think it was June 20th. Their, their acquisitions editor had said, yes, we have to publish this book, which is astounding. Like three weeks they had the book before they were like, yes, we want this book. And that is, that is a much closer to version to, to this book. Of course, it's been through many iterations since. But, um, but yeah, when I think back on it, I really wrote this book in the span of just a few months. And then brought in the history. Yeah. Um, early on, you talk about turning to sewing to deal with some traumas in your life. Why sewing and not music or dance or some other, mm -hmm. what, what was the sewing connection? I mean, I also turned to music um, and poetry, uh, but I think that part of the sewing was, um, I loved my, my home economics teacher in middle school and she taught me to sew and, and it became, you know, it became a thread through my life, and and so was music, though. And um, you know, but I think the trauma was so enormous that I um, I needed many forms <laughs> of healing. And of course, like in the '80s, you know, children were just kind of running, roaming the streets. You know, like we weren't we weren't really um, cared for in the way that I think we care for children now. Um, and so. I think that I needed lots of different forms of healing. I think we all do. And it seems like the sewing connected you with people in a way that, other than your home ec teacher, who was like your first believer, mm -hmm. um, the, the, um, Lee Sam, is that what you said? Yes, yeah, Lee Sam. And then, and then even later on, bartering, yeah. and how powerful that is. You, you talk about that in the book. Um, that, that that, um, the blueberry pen, I just, yeah. that's a great story. 
Um, I won't give it away. You'll have to read the book. <laughs> well, but Lee San is a character who a lot of people gravitate towards. Lee San was the mother of a student who I taught um, in Westford. And when I first got my teaching job in Westford, I was the first teacher they had hired in 17 years. I mean, they had, they had a declining student population. So every time the population slipped below a threshold, they would let the most recently hired teacher go, and they just were not hiring. So they had one unusually large class come through, and they hired me. Um, and then my job was like really unstable for a while until many people retired all at once. But I just didn't fit in with my colleagues. I was much younger than they were. And, um, and I, I was of a different mindset, which I think is why the principal hired me. I think he was looking for some new innovation. And um, so I was actually much closer to the parents than I was to my colleagues, which was just a weird, it's not usually the way that a professional teacher um, operates, but this one parent in particular um, reached out to me and and noticed I had mittens that looked like they had been made with uh, a sweater. They I don't know if they had been. I I can't even remember where I'd gotten them, but she had told me that she was making sweater mittens and invited me over to her house to make uh, mittens with her. And she was just such a like strong and independent woman and just a huge presence in the town. And so we became really quite good friends and we started making mittens together. And it was really, the mittens were really her idea. And after the inauguration, I didn't have any mittens for sale, but I was like, call this lady, you know, call my friend. Um, because we had long since dissolved our, our um, mitten making partnership, but we were still friends. And she, so lots of businesses reached out to me to partner with me, but businesses also reached out to her and she now has a shop in St. Albans where she does all kinds of repurposing of textiles and it's really cool. Yeah. yeah I looked her up online. She's wonderful. Yeah. Lisa Ann Coolidge is her name and she has outer known, uh, outer known store in um, St. Albans. So one of the things you talk about in the book was, is, is finding humor and joy in through the difficult times. Some, mm -hmm. some of the difficult times are personal, and some of them are because of the Bernie situation, which we'll get to. Um, but but there's a you, you talk about crafting out of sorrow and crafting for joy. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a real gift to being able to make that shift. And and I I'm wondering was it the friendship with Lisanne that helped you do that, or was it just what where you were in your journey? I definitely think that Lisanne showed me how to craft, you know, just through all of the joy, you know, and she just crafted all of the time. That was just, um, you know, she had three children and, and, and I think I described the inside of her house as she had a wood stove going and there was water boiling on the wood stove and, you know, salsa here and a beer there and lots of little kids running around and it was just so busy and joyful and, and it was a time when we were trying to have a baby and so, and she just, she was just such a joyful, lovely human. And, um, and I guess it really wasn't until I wrote this book that I picked up on the pattern of wow, like September 11th happened, I was trapped in North Carolina, I sewed a quilt, you know? We lost a baby, I sewed a quilt, you know, we, you know, I made some mittens, you know, it, it's, um, I think that, that when Lee Sand came into my life, she showed me this other way to craft too. Um, but I think that people, you know, people craft for all kinds of reasons, relaxing, it releases serotonin, it's, um, you know, it does make you happy in the end, and you have a beautiful thing. But yeah, the story of the blueberry pen is one of my favorite stories in the book. And I think because I wasn't a writer before I wrote this book, I mean, I had never published anything before. Um, when I, that is the second to the last chapter in the book, and I think if you compare that chapter with some of the earlier chapters in the book, you can definitely see that I got better at writing in the process of writing the book, which, you know, I think that's, that's true for a lot of writers. If you look at the Laura Ingalls Wilder series, there's a really big difference between Little House in the Big Woods and Little House on 
Plum Creek, right? Her writing gets better and more beautiful the more she does it. And, and I think that's, as humans, the more we practice, the more we improve. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. To go back to what you just said about after you've been crafting and, and feeling great about doing that in a time of a hard time, at the end of that, you have something beautiful. Yeah. And you have chosen to share those beautiful things with very various people, including Bernie Sanders. Yeah. And um, I didn't realize that when the inauguration mittens went viral, that was the second time you've been mm -hmm. faced with that kind of an incident. So did that make you more prepared to deal with the second time at all? No, I mean, so a year before when, I gave Bernie those mittens like five years before. He'd had them for a long time, which is kind of amazing because I always lose things like mittens. <laughs> but he had held on to them for a long time and um, he, he wore them on the campaign trail to Portsmouth, New Hampshire to the Women's March and he was kind of gesticulating and being very Bernie. Um, and somebody made a meme with rainbows uh, on his hands and it was funny. And I was kind of, I had a little flash of fame, just like local fame. Um, but there were, there were things on Twitter. My, my wife pointed out to me that people were saying things like, Bernie's grandmother knitted him mittens for Christmas. <laughs> And there were just so many things wrong with that statement that I felt, even though I really wasn't on Twitter much, I was like, I should go and correct those, um, those statements. And so I said, first of all, the mittens were um, repurposed wool sweaters. They weren't, I didn't knit them, I don't knit. And second of all, Bernie's Jewish, and I, I certainly didn't give them to him as a Christmas gift. And third of all, you know, Bernie's, um, his grandmother died before the Holocaust, but then many, many other people in his family were murdered in, in World War II. And um, I just feel like, you know what, could we please have some respect for this man and his family? And um, I made these mittens, and if you want some, I have a few for sale. And I, and I stupidly put my email up with that because I, I mean, it was such a small thing, and I really didn't think it was that big of a deal. Somebody on the day of the inauguration found that post and reposted it as if it was current. And, uh, and then 22,000 people emailed me. Yeah. Which was very stressful. <laughs> and, and they all wanted me. Yeah, and, or they wanted interviews, or they wanted to make a documentary or a film or write a book about it. Um, or, and actually that's where I got the idea to write a book. I was like, well, if they think they can write the book, I mean, it's my story, I should write the book. <laughs> um, everybody wanted a piece of it in some way. Were you tempted to try and set up a workshop to produce thousands of mittens? Yeah, I mean, I think that the thought crossed my mind. And where did that go? Well, I mean, nowhere, because I didn't want to do that. <laughs> I think a lot of thoughts crossed my mind. There was definitely, it seemed like there could be an opportunity to get rich quick, but my report cards were due, you know? I, that's what I was remembering. And my daughter was five, and you know, like I just feel like we had a puppy. I, there was so much, there were so many other important things going on that, um, and I, I knew that making mittens was a, a, a thing that I enjoyed, but if I turned it into something I was obligated to do, um, that I, I think that all of the joy would have just been sucked out of it. And I didn't want that for myself or for my family or for my colleagues or my students. You know, I just had too many other obligations. So there were a lot of businesses who wanted to partner with me and I partnered with the Vermont Teddy Bear Factory which was a great partnership. And my only stipulation was, if you want to partner with me, and I sold this to all of the businesses, my only request is that a portion of everything that, that I endorse goes to charity. Because at that time during the pandemic, there were just so many nonprofits who had lost opportunities to fundraise because of, of the quarantine. And so, and, um, and, the Vermont Teddy Bear Company was like, absolutely. And they, they um, created 10 new jobs, which is something I'm 
was am so proud of. And yeah, and they went <laughs> they went to new Americans. I mean, full time jobs with benefits and paid time off and just good jobs. So, um, you know. I didn't want to set up a cottage industry or open a factory, but that but people wanted this product and and so at first I was like there's lots of people online who sell them like go on Etsy and then but there was a bigger opportunity to make a difference here in Vermont and mm -hmm. so at first the the money from that um, partnership went to make a wish Vermont. Um, and after a year, we switched it to Outright Vermont, which is an organization that serves LGBTQ plus youth. Um, and they have used that money to um, have a second week of their summer camp program at Camp Common Ground, which is just so, that's another thing I'm really proud of because on the heels of the pandemic and, and there were so many queer youth who were just isolated. Um, and and left without the resources that they normally depended on meant for many of them school um, and so to have this opportunity to come together at Camp Common Ground and and um, and to have been behind the that in funding it um, it just felt like a win a huge win and so that's where so every, a portion of every sale of every mitten goes to um, goes to Outright Vermont and goes directly to Camp Common Ground. And I went a couple of summers ago and volunteered at the camp and it was awesome. I, I washed dishes, which was, it was so cool because I just had a bird's eye view of all of the wonderful things that were happening. And um, you know, it was, it was humbling, the bravery of the kids there. It was really great. Yeah, it's, 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 it's hard to remember that this was all happening in the middle of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. so people were very isolated and, and, mm -hmm. and trying to deal with that at the same time. Um, uh, and you, you know in the book that the meme brought smiles during the dark time because everybody who sees this image, yes. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's Bernie, it's, it's Mittens, it's Vermont. But it also brought out... Um, the imposters and others who uh, comprise mm -hmm. the quote un ugly underbelly of the internet, mm -hmm. and and it seems that you you dealt with that in a number of ways. One is to turn toward the Vermont teddy bear, and um, you were also talking to darn darn tough. tough. Yeah, yeah. I mean, people began impersonating me on online, saying they were selling my mittens using my. Um, using my image, I mean, which the only public image that I really had was my school photo from like five years before. Um, and, you know, um, the, the Attorney General's Office of the State of Vermont contacted me and wanted me to participate in an investigation and prosecution, and I was like, you know what, these folks, I feel bad for them. Their lives are desperate and, you know, I've said, I've, I've given like 30 interviews and in every single one, I said, I don't make the mittens anymore. You can get them from Vermont Teddy Bear Company. And the guy at the attorney general's office was like, well, you know, lots of people are going to be fooled by these folks. And, um, and it's mostly going to be um, elderly people. And then, of course, I was like, oh, such a soft spot for my grandparents. And so I was like, fine, I'll, I'll help you. And they got the, sh the sites shut down, but for months after I was getting just, you know, emails, phone calls, letters from people who had sent their money to who they thought was me. And so I explained to everybody, I responded to every single person and said, you know, I'm really sorry um, that, you, that you were fooled by this, but, you know, and, and I actually contacted Jack Thurston um, the reporter, and we did a, a little expose, and I connected him with some of the victims of this crime, and um, I was able to take that clip and, and email it to a lot of people and say, you know, watch this, and it explains everything. Yeah, that's it's so sad that that creativity gets channeled into mm -hmm. fraud yeah. than yeah, and even though I, so I made it public that I was writing a book, but um, at one point my, uh, my agent contacted me and said, okay, there's another book um, that is competing with your book. It's your story, but, and it's got your 
picture in it, and it was a, and so, um, and he was like, you know, there's lots of different avenues you could take. You could you could contact this author and say, you know, would you like my endorsement of my story, or, you know, or you could ask them not to not to move forward. So you know, and if they had, it was a children's book, and it was kind of neat. I mean, they sent me the proofs, um, but I was just so it felt so yucky that they didn't ask me, you know, like if they had reached out to me and asked me, I might've said yes. Mm -hmm. But the, the fact that they felt so entitled to tell my story and not even consult with me. I mean, Bernie gave his permission for his name to be on this and for his picture to be here. And like, um, you know, when I was going through the final editing stages of this book, I reached out to every single live person in the book who I named and asked if they wanted their real name or a pseudonym or, you know, mm -hmm. that's a lot of work. <laughs> and, um, but yeah, that, that writer didn't have the decency to just ask if, if they could tell my story. And so I, I told my agent to tell that person's agent that I don't support their book and they didn't get a contract. So is there a kid's book in, in you? I do have a kid's book. It's looking for a publisher, so we'll see. About, about the mittens? Or? It's, um, it's a little bit about the mittens, yeah. So um, teaching has been your career and you yeah. your self-image for almost two decades. Yeah. Um, teaching to, during the pandemic, um, you described that in the book, and it sounds like you had a fabulous outdoor classroom. Yes. <laughs> Um, but then things sort of went south. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the phrase, I thought it was very clear, it was, quote, um, uh, it was much harder, quote, like stopping a waterfall with a cotton ball. Yeah. That's a very powerful phrase. Mm -hmm. um, do you think you'll go back to teaching at some point? No. <laughs> I don't want to. I, you know, I think that I loved teaching when I did it, and now I'm in graduate school to become a therapist, and I'm enjoying that. Um, I've, I'm taking this year off because I'm writing another book, um, a fiction book, and I'm really enjoying writing, and I've been doing a lot of promotional things for this book, and um, as easy as it would be to just be like, I wrote the book, it's on the shelf. <laughs> Um, I felt like I needed to walk with the book for a little while and do events like this. And, and I, um, I did a TED talk here in town a few weeks ago. Um, and I felt like I couldn't just write it and abandon it, that I needed to um, promote it. And, and, um, and my next book is really different than it's, well, like I said, it's fiction. And there's murder and all kinds of drama. <laughs> And, um, and it's fun. I'm having a good time writing it. And um, who knows? I do want to be, I, I'm really committed to finishing my degree. And uh, well, I already have a master's in education, but I want to, um, you know, get my master's in m clinical mental health counseling and open a practice um, and keep writing books, maybe. Keep writing books. So I want, I've got three pages of questions. <laughs> I, I, really enjoyed reading this book. Um, there's stories that I haven't gotten to yet, but I want to open the floor up. Are there people that have questions? Yes. Hey, Jen. I had a chance to see you at the TED program. It was really interesting. Thank and you. Part of that story um, that you haven't yet mentioned is why you sent Bernie the Mittens. And I just thought maybe, it, it, I know it's really brief, but right. there's some context that my friends that I brought here tonight haven't yet heard. Well, I thought that Bernie was going to retire. And, um, and you know, he, had run for president in 2016, and you know, and he lost the uh, the nomination, the Democratic nomination to Hillary Clinton, and then Clinton lost to Trump, and so, you know, I thought that he was moving towards the end of his career, and I wanted to give him a shout out to thank him really for, um, you know, his support of gay rights and and really his support of of lots of people of. Of lots of people who I'd worked with for for you know the better part of two two decades, um, and so his daughter-in-law was the director of my daughter's preschool, 
and she was also a friend of mine from college. And so I was making mittens for the preschool teachers for the holidays, and I um, made an extra pair for Bernie, and she gave them to him. I've never met Bernie. I don't know him. <laughs> he called me once on the phone and said thanks. <laughs> so now we know who, like I know, well, he knows who I am, and sometimes, you know, will wave from across a crowded room, but he's always surrounded by people. One of these days, he's a walker, and one of these days I think maybe I'll run into him in the woods, and then I'll really, I'll say something, and then we'll really have a conversation, but until then. It's really interesting. You never know that when you send an article that you've crafted into the world what its effect, what, what the yeah. effects are going to be. And yeah. This is a, a, a perfectly, mm -hmm. perfect example. Are there other questions? What grades are you Mostly second, but I also taught first and third. And when I first started teaching, I was with Teach for America, and I was in um, North Carolina, and I taught high school, high school English. Yeah, it was a big difference. What year did you leave teaching? Um, I left teaching a year and a half ago, so it was in the spring of 2022. I did give some mittens to Kamala Harris. Did you hear from her? After no. no. Nope. I sent them through Bernie. Oh. And I also gave them, uh, well, I, sent, I gave them to Liza, who was the director of the preschool, to give to Bernie, to give to Kamala and Joe. Because I felt like, you know, the mittens was not what that day was about. <laughs> but <laughs> it definitely eclipsed yeah. some, of, some of the drama. But, you know... Yeah, I, I wanted them to have mittens, too, to join in the fun. And, and if they wear them out, maybe they'll have their own viral moment. We all could use another funny meme. <laughs> Other questions? So there's, I, I sort of want to close that, um, uh, that you know, you were understand, understandably overwhelmed with the 22,000 Email. Yeah. Um, but I really honor that you eventually took a step back and really asked yourself what you wanted. And you came up with a phrase that I wrote down. It's like, rather than, you know, the, the, the phrase online, um, FOMO, fear of missing out. Mm. Well, she came up with joy of missing out. And it's like really okay yeah. to miss out. Mm -hmm. And because it's not really missing out. It's, it's taking another step. Yeah. And um, I don't know if you wanted to say anything about that or where, where, where it landed you having made that decision. Well, I don't think I invented the joy of missing out. I think, I, I think somebody else said that, and I was like, exactly, that's Jomo. Um, but, you know, just because people are out partying on the town doesn't mean that that's where you want to be on any given, in any given moment. And, um, yeah, I think that I... I really started thinking about like what the difference between what I should do and what other people think I should do versus what I just wanted to do and being guided by my own intuition um, and my own values, um, which became a lot more clear when I started really thinking about, you know, w when so many people are asking you all of these questions about your life, it's like, well, I kept saying, well, I can't do that because I'm busy. I, I'm a teacher. But then people made up all kinds of things like, well, teaching is her vocation and it's her true calling. And I'm like, well, that's not really it either. <laughs> I mean, that's what my TED Talk was about. It was, it was about leaving teaching. I, I left teaching because I was, you know, pretty burnt out, like a lot of teachers in America right now. And, um, and I, I was looking for something else, but I, just because I was looking for something else didn't mean that what I wanted was to become like a mitten entrepreneur. <laughs> you don't have to take every opportunity that rolls up. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I, I honor that and I look forward to seeing more books coming. This is very thank exciting. You. So thank you very much for coming. Thank tonight. you for having thank me. You all for, uh, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.